fifth episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And today, an absolute honor and a pleasure and a delight for STS Nation and a shout out right off the top to Lindsay Gandy, who helped us put this all together. Uh, but you're about to meet Lori Vallow's brother, Adam, and Uncle Rex, otherwise known on his screen as Grunkle Rex. And uh, there you go. So they are here. I'll introduce them formally in a moment. But uh, as our audience all knows by now, Lori Vallow was sentenced to life in prison without parole um, on July 31st, but she's still awaiting trial in another case. She is separately charged in Arizona with conspiring to murder her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, who sort of uh, blew the whistle uh, with the Chandler PD. And I'm going to ask uh, these two men about that. Uh, and she did that with the help of her now deceased brother, Alex Cox, uh, who mysteriously also died three months after the children's disappearance. She's also charged, uh, Lori Vallow is, with conspiracy to murder her niece's estranged husband. That is Brandon Boudreau after he narrowly escaped a drive-by shooting. And today, as I mentioned, her family is here, her flesh and blood. Rex Connor is Lori Vallow Daybell's uncle, and Adam Cox is Lori's brother. And together, they host the Silver Linings podcast, and they also have a book that is out that you should check out called, fittingly, Lori's Lies and Family Ties. I like that name a lot. Um, Adam, how'd you come up with the title? I'm always curious about catchy book titles. Well, I know it's a catchy, it's a, it's a weird transition. When I wrote my first book, I was trying to figure out, I was talking to people about, you know, what do you put on the cover of a book? And they're like, well, you don't want it too long because you want to explain what the book is about in the title. And they're like, make it one word if you can, or at least make it something that's catchy or rhymes. And, you know, I've been in radio 30 years. And so, you know, those are the things I was just put down a bunch of things on paper that what this book was about. And those two things, like how many lies did Lori actually tell? And, um, and it's tied to all of us. And we're the ones about our podcast or book. You know, you guys probably know way more details than Rex and I do about the case, but we were more in a perspective of how, it, how this has affected our family. So Lori's lies and family ties just kind of fit together. Hmm. Um, and there you see the book cover. I assume it is available anywhere books are sold now. Is it on Amazon? Uh, Grunkle Rex? Why the Grunkle Rex? Well, I don't try to distance myself from the fact that I'm Lori's uncle, but I'd rather honor the fact that I'm Tylee and JJ's great uncle. And in our family, we're too lazy to say both words. We just <laughs> smash them together and call it Grunkle. Hmm. And uh, yes, question it's available on uh, at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, normal places. Our audio book just came out last week, so there's an audio and a Kindle version also. Um, that is amazing to hear. Uh, did you guys voice it? Did you and uh, Adam voice it? We did, and we are not professionals. If you hear it, you'll you'll know. Well, Adam's this guy's a radio personality. What are you talking about? This guy's got thirty years. By the way. I'm more impressed by the fact that this guy, after 30 years in uh, radio, has transitioned to being not just a pickleball player, but a professional. Is this true? You are a professional pickleball player, Adam Cox? Well, I have played in professional tournaments, um, done pretty good. I now do it for a living. I'm the head pickleball pro at here at AAG in Mesa, Arizona. So apparently people are calling me a pro. I mean... That's that's what they're telling me. But I put a lot of time and, and effort into everything that I do in radio and then now in pickleball. So I may have like I may focus way too much on one thing at one time. Uh, I set these really big goals in my life and then I I try to figure out how to achieve those goals. So, you know, when people told me you can never be a radio DJ in, at Z100 in New York, which is the number one radio station in the country, they all laughed at me. 
until I did it. And then when I turned 50, I said, I'm going to play professional pickleball. And they all laughed at me. And then I did it. So I don't know if it's a challenge thing or what it is, but um, I feel like, or distraction, that could be, that could be something too. Kudos to you, man. I'm from <clears throat> Jersey. I know <clears throat> Z100 very well. The morning zoo yeah. 100. Yep. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. How, when were you in New York? How, what year? Uh, I was there for three years, 96 through 99. <clears throat> very cool. For those who do not yep. know, uh, Z100 is, uh, the Mecca of radio right there. Uh, there are already tons of questions and, and Adam has somewhat limited time. He's going to teach a pickleball class. I need lessons, Adam. Um, I can, I can do that. You come to Mesa, Arizona, or if you want to fly me anywhere in the country, I can <laughs> teach you. When my podcast gets bigger, maybe I'll fly you out until yeah, then. Yeah, there you we'll, go. We'll do it yeah. via Zoom for now. But um, Rex, uh, I hate, hate to get into the uh, downside of this, which is all the negative attention that Lori has uh, kicked up. But uh, this question coming to us from Ashley Rose, uh, what, what do you think of Lori's religious beliefs, um, Rex, and do you think she's still believing what she did believe? So, Ashley, I appreciate the way you worded that question, because while Adam and I both grew up in the same religion, the same church, we do not share the same religious beliefs that Lori currently has. She veered off so severely, it's not, it's not really related to the way we believe. And I believe the alternative reality that she and Chad created, I think she'll stay in that for the rest of her life. I don't think she can come out of that because if you come out and you face reality as opposed to your alternative delusion, she, how would someone deal with what she did? It, it, you just can't. I don't think a human can do that. So I think she's stuck there for for the rest of her life. Mm. Uh, that might be the safest, safest place for her mentally. Um, right. And maybe, maybe for the rest of us, uh, tennis girl, uh, just wanting to know if you guys are going to be, it's really crime con, but here they call it carm con. Cause my mom is the matriarch oh, yes. Carmela. So they call it carm con. Are you guys going to crime con? You bet. Can you tell? You'll be there. Okay. Excellent. So there you go. More reason to come to crime con. Um, I, on a, on a much more serious note, obviously, uh, Tylee and JJ, um, the, the two biggest victims, of course, with Tammy and, and Charles. Um, Adam, tell me about your relationship with, with Tylee and JJ and what this, what this has been like for you. Well, um, well, my relationship with Tylee and JJ, I was the one that never lived next to my family since I was in radio and was all lived all over the country. So I didn't see them every single day, like, you know, some of the other siblings that lived all together. So, um, but my relationship with Tylee was great. Uh, my relationship with JJ was great. Um, miss, I miss both of them a ton. Um, and it's just really sad that they're never going to get to experience certain things in life. And, and, um, and the way that, everything transpired you know rex and i did a podcast not too long ago and we were doing goat yoga we went to goat yoga in mesa arizona did a live podcast from a goat yoga <laughs> and one of the one of the girl women that worked there was in Lori's ward at church and she was saying that uh, her daughter was friends with tylee and at one point tylee mentioned to her my mom thinks i'm a zombie now Back then, before any of this ever transpired, what do you really think about that? Um, like, what does that even mean? But now we all know what that means. Um, and just trying to think about what Tylee went through, what she knew, um, uh, that she didn't feel like she could reach out and tell any of us what was going on. I mean, there's a lot of heartbreak when you think about the situation that Tyler was in. Now, JJ being highly autistic has come a long way. Lori did a great job raising him um, and put a lot of time and effort into raising him. And he was just, you know, way above where he should have been uh, with all of the way that he turned out. Um, so just knowing all those things and then having this uh, bomb explode 
uh, it, it, how does it feel? It's, it's been, um, it's been a nightmare. It's been hard to deal with. Um, so, uh, don't really know the feelings, how to describe it to people, but, um, yeah, it's been difficult. Yeah. I don't think that's something that's easily put into, uh, into words, but Rex, um, Tylee and JJ, you know, I, I, there's not even a question you can really ask, but I'll just leave it open-ended. Uh, I guess, what do you miss most? And, uh, you know, how are you coping now these many months later? Um, Tylee was, I didn't, I also didn't live anywhere near them and I had fewer interactions with them than Adam did, but um, we stayed with them while they lived in Hawaii um, stayed there in the house, and we've had a lot of interactions, more with Tylee, of course, and uh, we just loved how she was as a teenager. I, I enjoy working with teens anyway, and Tylee was just the kind that um, that adults enjoy because she was just spunky enough to make things <laughs> challenging for um, parents or anyone that crossed her, but it was just it's fun. It's fun to watch her interact. She's so intelligent. It's fun to interact with her. And those are the types of memories you think of when you think that, that you'll never see him again. You know, and JJ, um, we saw him as just this um, very positive destruction machine. He could, he was, he had very strong upper body strength and could dismantle anything he would get his hands on, not out of anger. He wasn't an angry little guy. He did it because he could. <laughs> he just enjoyed it. And he had, when we visited them in Hawaii, we went to a social event. He had to have eyes on him the whole time, every second. He could not get away from, in that case, it, it was Charles. Charles had uh, JJ duty that evening because he would go and destroy something just just for fun. You, you miss memories like that. Okay. Uh, you sure do. Uh, I'm so sorry what happened to the family. Um, you know, everyone's got their story. Uh, this is obviously a very difficult story to bear, but I was actually with my mom today. Uh, periodically, she goes to school. She's a Holocaust survivor, and she was talking to eighth graders today, and uh, they were trying to get inside her head, you know, try to understand what it was like in 1942. And uh I could see their brains cranking away, trying to figure it out. And sometimes uh, when certain people have been through a certain situation, there's really no way to grasp it. And I think, uh, unfortunately, that's, you know, your family's case. I don't think anyone but your family really understands. Um, Courtney uh, says, um, Rex and Adam, do you keep in touch with Lori? Um, Adam, you know, she's in Arizona. Uh, you're in Arizona. Uh, any interest in seeing her do you see her have you seen her um i have not seen her i haven't talked to her i haven't talked to her since the day that she um told me she was trans you know turning into a translated being um and i didn't you know she thought she told me she goes well you think i'm crazy don't you and i was like well i don't know if you're crazy or not but i know what you're telling me is not true and after that point she cut me off and we haven't really talked since so i haven't seen her in a long time or talked to her in a long time um people on our podcast have asked me will you go see her she's here in arizona um at this point i don't know what the point would be if, if she's in this delusion or she's never gonna you know, you can't have a normal conversation with her. I don't think there's any, anything I can get out of, uh, talking to her. Um, but out of curiosity, just to see or to hear for myself what she's doing or how she's doing that out of curiosity, I, I may would want to do that. But other than that, I don't think I would never expect to get any kind of answers or anything out of her. And Adam, just, you know, for those who are listening to this for the first time, what, what was childhood like with Lori? I mean, what was, was it a happy childhood? Was she a happy kid? Uh, oh yeah. Relationship. Yeah. Yeah. We, I wrote, I wrote about this. It's been the beginning of our book, uh, talked about my whole family, how we were on Saturdays and what we did and Sundays and during the week. And, you know, we had a normal childhood. I, I loved my childhood. I thought it was great. Um, so. Um, it's, it's weird that people like, well, if she did what she did, how could she have been normal? 
uh, as a kid. She must have had all kinds of problems. And Rex and I talk about this on our podcast and in the book is about, um, you know, people can be good people for a long period of time. And then you veer off because you, you know, have, you make bad choices and then, or you, the way we still feel like Lori went off, she started listening to these uh, podcasts and she started reading these near death experience books. And then she, you know, started believing all these uh, fictitious things. And even Chad being a fictitious writer, she, you know, it fell right into her lap of the things that she enjoyed and was really passionate about. So, um, but as a kid, she was great. She just cheerleader and she played sports and she laughed and we, you know, just a normal kid. And Adam, I presume since you hadn't seen her in a while, uh, have you ever met Chad or no? No, I've never met Chad, never talked to him. Didn't know who he was, any of that. Okay. And um, Rex, same same thing to you. I mean, do you plan uh, at any point or have you seen Lori? Do you have any interest in seeing her? Well, other than seeing her at the trial, you know, we we saw each other. We acknowledged, you know, that we had seen each other. But, of course, you don't get to talk to him there. And like Adam, I don't know what talking with her would serve. My understanding is in Arizona, she has she had not been allowed to get visitors and now, um, if you want to visit, you have to apply, and then she can say, yes, I want to hear them, which actually one of my daughters has done. She applied, and previously that, well, all, all of my daughters had said, no, they don't need to talk to her again, that seeing her at trial was enough. But one of them now, if she gets the chance, we'll, uh, we'll give it a try. Um, Carol wants to know, Adam, this kind of, we're free will, and I had it all structured out, but screw it sometimes you yeah. go off hey just go just just go with it we Rex and I, if you ever watch our podcast you're gonna see oh this is the most unprofessional podcast you've ever seen yeah. no 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 rundown for this one but uh carol wants to know adam uh what what do you think you know laurie's got this sort of devilish smile and she uh exposed that smile at this last year do you watch the hearings by the way do you look at them or do you try to keep your no. head out of that yeah, I try to stay away from all of it. It's just, it's too much for me. But I did watch the last, I guess, when Lori gave her her speech at at the trial. I did see that part. Um, I don't really follow anything or know anything. But for me, too, I feel like, you know, and I don't know how religious people are, but I believe that, you know, the devil can get a hold of people and it can make you, you know, follow choices that you or, or make choices that um, once you start down a path, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And to me, when I see Lori on TV or through the picture, I don't even recognize who she is. She doesn't look like the whole face, the eyes. I just, I don't see her in there. So it's really a weird experience to look at her. Um, I hate, I don't want to do this to you, but the COE just pulled this up and this is a little clip of her smiling. Let's just watch it together. We can get Rex's uh, take on this. And then uh, if you want to weigh in, uh, Adam, you can. Let's see here. Nothing at this time, Your Honor. Judge, given that uh, we're going to be going through discovery for the next foreseeable months, and we would ask if we could waive Ms. Powell's presence at the next CCMC. Um, say our position on it. No, Your Honor. All right, we'll waive your parents for the next conference. We're going to set that for. It's kind of heavy with the prison makeup there, Rex. I noticed that for sure. But, um, you know, no one really knows what's happening inside her mind, but I don't think it's a healthy mind. I think it's safe to say that if I was responsible or if any of us were responsible for the death of anyone for any reason, um, you wouldn't really see many smiles on my face. What, what do you... What do you make of it, Rex? You know, I, I have a very wise youngest daughter who used to be, in fact, Lori's nanny and was the author of the cover of the book that you showed. And I adopted her approach to that particular question. When I asked her a, a similar question, she said, you know, Dad, I have such low expectations of Lori at this point. Nothing bothers me. And I really like that in the victim statements um 
at the at the trial, a couple of them said, we don't have to think about you anymore now. And so when I see Lori acting like that, I just adopt that idea of she's going to do what she's going to do. And I'm not going to spend any life energy getting sick over it because that's what I would do <laughs> if I were going to spend energy personally. Yeah, um, it, it's it's amazing to actually I can almost I can feel I don't want to sound cheesy here, but, you know, this is the first time we're meeting. I spoke to Gigi McKelvey, a pretty lies and alibis. who has a great podcast mm -hmm. and she she has great energy, but she's like, oh, yeah, Rex and Adam are awesome guys. And I feel this unbelievable positivity from you guys. And your podcast is called the Silver Linings Podcast. Uh, it's one of the things I talk about in my book is I just don't understand um, in a lot of ways where Holocaust survivors not only got the will to kind of continue, but to thrive in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, just to, to make it personal, because it's the only thing you can do. I I'm watching my mother really suffer for the first time because of the loss of my father of 63 years. And she'll tell you it's harder than the Holocaust. She lost a child. It's harder than that. Um, every everybody goes through their own thing, but she still manages to stay positive um, as hard as it is for her. How do you, Adam, have such a exuberant energy? I mean, now you're pursuing professional pickleball. You're you you know you and I are. I think you got a couple of years on me. I hope at least a couple. I'm in my. How old so, are you? Let's get down 50, to the brass brass 50, tacks here. Fifty four, baby. Born in sixty nine. Oh, me too. Oh yeah, oh, same yeah. age. Yeah, you except for right? my birthday. My birthday is very soon, April fourth. I might be a little older. Yeah, a little older. I'm July twenty fifth. So you are. Yeah, I knew I was older. older. I'm always the oldest guy in the room, <laughs> except for when I'm with Rex. <laughs> Rex is staying awfully quiet right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but let me ask you. I mean, where is this silver lining that you're finding coming from, and why did you choose to call the podcast Silver Linings? Well, you know, we started this podcast because Rex and I decided that um, I, have, I had already written a, written a ton of stuff on, on paper and I was going to release a book and Rex's book just came out. And he said, you know, there's one chapter that he was really thinking about, Lori, as he was writing this chapter about, you know, following your conscience or, you know, or not following your conscience and, you know, letting those get to you. And he was telling me about that a little bit. And, and then I've written a bunch of emotional things down on paper and was going to release a book. And the reason I wanted to write a book was to help uh, help other families. Um Hold on one second. I got it. My it's his pickleball coach, the 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 pro okay. calling in. Look at that. Um, let's I let's. Uh, I think he's fro. I think he's freezing up. But Rex, I mean, back to you on this same topic. I can tell too. I mean, look at your face. You've got this angelic face, Rex. You're sitting there in a beautiful state of Utah. You seem very well put together you told me you admitted you're wearing a dress shirt for the first time because you've got a dinner that's okay um but but where where do you get this positivity from rex grunkle rex yeah i, I gotta tell you and i think adam was heading this direction in his explanation um it's been such a surprise for us how what a great impact our listeners have been on us and on each other and we call them optimists and a lot of our optimists are also part of the STS nation. And, and we've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of their comments come up on the screen here. But the fact that people can come out and honestly deal with the terrible things that are happening in their life and try to find something positive about it, as all these optimists are doing, that's been a big inspiration for us and an important part of our healing. Adam and I are both like that naturally, trying to find good things. And you just have to deal with this, the crap that life gives you and move on. Good grief, I'm telling you <laughs> when you have the mother you have. But you have to do that. And it helps to have other people around you that will do that. So we want to be those people and be around those people. Adam, you're back. Go ahead and carry on what you were. Yeah, well, yeah I was. 
I, I was going right down the same thing. Um, you know, trying to find positive things in your life. There was there was a moment. There was moments in my life when all this was going down. The reason I wanted to write the book is because I wanted to help other families that maybe had something go on in their lives where one person was cut out. And um, and my my message in our book is make sure you talk everything out. Make sure you don't leave anything uncovered when when it comes to families um, because of what happened between me and my family. So that was one of the big reasons I wanted to write the book is to help make sure that that what happened to our family doesn't happen to other people's families. Mm. Um, By the way, shout out to CVS 50 surviving the survivor memberships. I always say best guess, better community. Uh, This question isn't fair, but I want to bring it up here so Adam can defend himself. Do they accept that the Cox family is weird? I mean, maybe Adam is weird in his own little way, but, um, (laughs) but, but, you know, back to this. So you're, you're both, I believe still in the LDS church. Um, but Adam, if you could just explain a little more pointedly, what, if anything, um, you can attribute this hard left turn uh, that Lori took. I mean, where did this, do you think it was all influenced by Chad? Do you think there is some mental illness component? Um, where do you think it emanated from? Well, I, I believe, and Rex and I have talked about this several times. I talk about it in the book and on the podcast, but I believe that, you know, individuals, um, can come up with anything that they want in their life. And I feel like, the one time I feel like when Lori was snapping was when she told all of us that, um, that Joe, her third husband, um, molested Colby and Tylee. And that night she was lost her mind and she was going to drive off and drive with the kids off. Uh, you've heard that story where she was going to, you know, but drive the kids off on into a, a ditch or whatever it was she said. And all of us at that moment in time were like, oh, well, that's that's a mom in distress just l- letting off steam. Um, that, in my mind, may be where she was, you know, started to have mental problems if, if she did. And then the other thing is that slowly but surely she started going down this path of reading these near-death experiences. And she really felt something about that. And then, you know, all these people talking about the end of the world. And she really jumped on that. And then she... One time she told me that she goes, have you ever heard of Julie Rowe? And I was like, no, she's like, "Uh, well, she's got a podcast. And I said, okay, good for you. And then she said, uh, she's like, well, you need to listen to her podcast. She's, there's going to be these, um, there's going to be these campouts and everybody's going to have to go and the end of the world's coming and all these things are happening. She got really tied up into all these things into the world. And she wanted to tell us when the end of the world was and uh, these near death experiences. I feel like Lori wanted to be something special and she never got to be something special in her life, in her own mind. So she just made up being special. And when she met Chad and then Chad started with all of his crap. Oh, well, we were married in five different worlds and um, and throwing in all the Harry Potter stuff. And it's just like it was like putting gas on a fire. And so that's the only reason I feel Lori was already headed down that pathway. Now, I don't think if she if Lori met Chad that she would have done what she did. I don't know that for sure, but I don't think she would have. She would have been in some I think she would have been in some kind of delusion. Uh, about the end of the world and whatever that had. But with Chad talking about dark spirits and people are zombies and they have to be killed, like all fictitious stuff, you know, that's when, that's when she really jumped in and, and, and got Alex somehow, my brother involved in it all. And so I think there was, it's not just one direct turn. I think this was years, like three or four years of that headed that direction. And Adam, since you mentioned Alex, I was going to bring it up in a moment, but Alex seemed to be, um, according to most, you know, people who are really following this very closely under Lori's spell under her thumb. Was he, what was going on there? Well, Rex looks like him. Rex, what was he? (laughs) People get Alex and Rex, people get Alex and Rex confused (laughs) all the time. Rex, what was Alex like? I mean, he was, you know, Alex and I were, were close. Um, until he got converted and it was a conversion into the spell as you call it he heard a lori 
started talking to him and Alex would listen to the podcast. Unlike Adam, Adam didn't want any more church than, you know, what he had to go to on Sunday. But Alex was all about that and listening. And and he heard one that really touched him and became converted to it. And man, he was gone. The old Alex was gone and and he was he was all in on what Lori was doing. And Adam and I believe, if you don't mind, you didn't ask, but I want to carry this on. Adam and I believe that towards the end, Alex was figuring out, it sounds like by what Zulema said, and we don't know how much of that we can uh, believe or not, but he was finally figuring it out. And it's a tragedy that he died with her. Lori and Chad killed him or had him killed or he committed suicide. We don't know. We, there's kind of a split split decision on that. But uh, if that had not happened, we would now know, we, all of us, would now know everything about what was going on because Alex would have sung like a little bird. That's very, very fascinating. And I was going to ask you that as a follow-up question. So I think his death was deemed due to quote-unquote natural causes i i personally find that very hard to believe uh rex do you have a a personal take on it i'm i'm with you on that um and i go back and forth between they had someone poison him or he poisoned himself um like a little bit like we said before about about lori if she came out of her whatever state of mind and faced reality, how would you deal with that? Well, it's very possible that if Alex came out of his state of mind, he couldn't deal with that. So that's a very possible scenario. They took his own life, I think. Um, I think that is also very possible. Um, it's sad that I don't think we're ever going to really know. Um, so many unanswered questions. But uh, Mary Patterson, can Adam share how red flags were ignored uh, when, you know, did, did you go to law enforcement, Adam? I don't know this part, but I do know that obviously Charles Vallow voiced a lot of concerns and uh, Chandler PD. And, you know, I don't know if they turned a blind eye, but uh, I think more could have been done. Um, but did did you experience red flags? Were you were you onto this prior to, as you put it, the bomb going off? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, when Lori started down this road, um, I, you know, went to my mom and dad and said, look, Lori's, she's, there's something wrong with her. We get, we need to get her help. And, you know, my dad's response was, well, she's in some kind of weird delusion, but she'll come out of it when she's ready. She hasn't hurt anybody. And at this point she hadn't, well, at least that we thought that was Thursday morning when I was with my mom and dad driving them to drop them off and I was going to take their car since I was staying with them. Um, and little did we know that Charles was dead at Lori's house at the time. My mom and dad said, Lori um, hasn't hurt anybody at this point. So just leave her alone that, you know, but there was red flags before that just talking. And, you know, when I guess I just feel like common sense, Look, when you can see something clearly and it's common sense, th whether they're family or not family, I mean, you have to you have to recognize those things. And I feel like our my family kind of like maybe I don't know if they turned to lie, but they just didn't believe that, you know, anything like this could have ever happened. So they decided, you know, we're not, you know, going to go down that path of of, you know, thinking Lori's doing anything crazy. Um, so I was all alone. I was on a lone Island about for a long time with that. Yeah. Um, you know, Adam, I'm just going back to, uh, this notion cause, uh, uncle Rex brought it up. You know what? Lori's got a long time ahead of her, um, to be alone and think about all this. If she did have sort of a moment of, um, reality, a, a smack of reality hitting her in the face, how do you, let me ask this question differently. If what would a 20 year old Lori Vallow or a 25 year old Lori Vallow think of the Lori Vallow today? Oh, she would think she was crazy. So, so 20, 25 year old Lori, take, take us to, to that Lori. What was she like? Um, her character, her personality, her sense of humor kind of, if you can draw that picture for us. 
from 20 to 25, well, when she was 16, she got married uh, for six weeks, got that annulled. And then she met a guy named Will. She came to live with me in Austin, Texas. I was a radio DJ there. She wanted a, a, a fresh start after she uh, annulled her first marriage to the 16 or 17 year old guy. Um, and so I told her she could come live with me in Austin, Texas. Well, she came and um, she got a job and she was trying to, you know, be a hairstylist. So she was going to school and then had a job at the Chess King in the Barton Creek Mall in Austin, Texas. Lo and behold, she met Will, um, brought Will to my house uh, and said, or to my apartment and said, hey, Will's going to move in with us. And then she introduced him. And he goes, hey, man, I'm going to get groceries. Don't worry about anything. I was like, OK, first of all, this is not happening. And they left that night. Lori ended up marrying him. He ended up beating her up. She was an abusive relationship. Uh, I talk about this in the book. One of the most emotional parts of, of the book for me, too, was, you know, going to pick up Lori um, at a gas station pregnant with a belly bump and a bloody nose and, you know, knowing that her uh, husband beat her up and she called me to come get her. So I talk a lot about that in the book. Um, but there, because of that, um, I think Lori, uh, then got divorced, was still a hairstylist. That's when she met Joe. Uh, but she was a hard worker. I mean, she made a lot of money, but she worked from 6 AM to 6 PM or 8 PM. And then she'd go pick up Colby and go to my mom's house. So she had a somewhat normal life for a long time. Yeah, and Adam, someone was ask, just asking about Joe Ryan. If you think that Lori had anything to do with his demise, I'm I'm fifty fifty on it. To be honest with you, um, fifty percent of me thinks that you know Lori and Alex somehow broke into his apartment and poisoned him and killed him somehow, some way. And the other fifty percent of me, you know, since he did have all those heart machines and and unhealthy, that he died of a heart attack. So, I. I am I'm really on the line there at 50 50. I don't know. But whatever that whatever happened there really transported Lori, because at that point she was like very spiritual. She was like, OK, so God then killed uh, Joe or God allowed me to kill Joe either way. Um, so he's on my side. This is, this is his direction of putting me in the pl position where I need to be or whatever. I feel like that cat catapulted the whole thing of the way then she killed Charles and that whole thing all went through. Let me, let um, me add, yes. Yeah, jump Lord in, Rex. Was spiritual in her version of being spiritual. She'd read the scriptures, go to church, but when you're talking about killing someone, it's not the same brand of spirituality that the most of the rest of the world um, subscribes to. Right. Um, Rex, back to you with this question from Jenny Price and uh, shout out to Philadelphia shoulder surgeon for that super chat. Who in the family supported her, meaning Lori, and believed her? Anyone else still trying to see her or maintain contact aside from Rex's daughter, Rex? Not too many people in the extended family believed her. Obviously, Janice and, and Summer did, and they, they famously declared that on, on TV. Um, my other sister and Janice's sister supported her sister. So she took that position that Janice needs my support and whatever she says, I'm along with her. But uh, not too many people in the rest of the family. Adam, can you think of anyone else that, um, you know, outside of your immediate family, but in the family really went along with what she was saying? No, not that I know. I don't know. I don't know anybody that was. Not even. Except for, except for Alex. Well, Alex, definitely. But not even Brax, who really got her started down the prepper path. Lori's cousin, Adam's cousin, my nephew, um, Gar started down. But at that point, he was not following what she was doing. Even though they had some of the same prepper practices, he, he pulled out when he saw how off the rail she had gone. Um, Adam from Jenny Pajama Pants. This is a, a very oh, what heavy. a great what a great name, <laughs> by the way. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, out, out in Utah and Arizona, I think you say pajama, but in Jersey, we say pajama. So there you pajama, go. Pajama, pajama. Same, same difference. If Chad yeah. is ultimately found guilty, this is heavy and gets a death penalty. 
uh, would the Cox family attend to stand witness for JJ and Ty Lee? Um, I don't know that I could do that myself, but uh, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to stay away from as much court as I can. I don't want to be in court. I don't want to testify. I don't want to be involved in it. It's very painful for me. As far as Chad goes, I've never met Chad. I've never talked to him. Um, I don't plan on ever talking to him or standing in the same room as him. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I would, I mean, I know, I know what I would say to Tylee and JJ and I already have prayed and I've already had that. So I don't need that to be public in, in a court. Um, the question, go ahead, may, Rex. question may have been, would you go to the, it didn't say this specifically, but would you go to the execution? And no, yeah, I'm not one just to throw my two cents in. I I don't need to go see an execution, but if someone in our family, I wouldn't do it for the public, a public perception, but if someone in our family felt we needed a person there, because the question was to stand up for Tylee and JJ, if someone in the family felt that we needed someone to do it, I would do it for people in our family. It, I it, it, but you know, it, it is kind of wild that there are these two uh, with Brian Koberger as well, very high profile death penalty cases in the state of Idaho. And now they've um, brought back the firing squad. So uh, that is uh, that's very heavy stuff. And, um, you know, maybe one day a decision will have to be made about that. But uh, I, 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 you know, that's, that's a tough road to hoe, as they say. Um How's your relationship with Melanie's now? Are you in contact with her? Um, are your parents, um, Adam, anything with Melanie's these days? Um, I haven't really talked to Melanie in a long time. I think it was a year or two ago. She invited me over to her house for Thanksgiving. I think we talked on the phone for a few minutes, but it wasn't anything um, long or, but and I, I declined and not because I don't love Melanie because I do love Melanie, but um, I just have so many questions and I feel like if I got in front of her in a room, I would just, I wouldn't be able to stop, you know, asking questions and it'd probably be awkward for her and she probably wouldn't want to, or I, I, at this point, I don't know, but, um, so that's where I'm at with Melanie. I think, you know, if this case comes up with, uh, you know, Brandon's thing, we'll probably find out more. Um, but as far as I know, um, I, I don't, I haven't had any plans. My parents see Melanie all the time and summer sees Melanie all the time. They still have a really good relationship. Hmm. Um, Elena just wants to know, I, I, and I think I heard this, uh, you guys are donating some of the proceeds to a charity. Is that right? From the book? Yeah. All of the, all of the book proceeds go directly to a, a nonprofit foundation that a good friend of mine and I started five years ago. We did a little bit, and then we both had to go back to work for a living. And uh, so it hasn't been doing much, but we are excited to get it going again. And that's where the proceeds are going. Yeah, I hate when uh, work gets in the way. You got to actually work to make a living. That's no fun. I know. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I feel you with that dress shirt there, uh, Rex. Um, Adam, I asked this question because I. I even though I can't, I try to put myself in your shoes and I just know the way my brain works and you're very lucky. Your brain doesn't work the way my brain does, Adam. But if uh, God forbid my sister did something like this right away, I would wonder, do I have this capacity? Do I have something like this in me? Have you ever pondered that? Has it ever scared you or made you nervous? No, never even crossed my mind to be actually, actually, <laughs> uh, that's why I said uh, you're better off without my mind. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's just so far fetched for me. Like if you, if I was like somebody watching it on TV, I'd be like, Oh my gosh, that is nuts. That would never happen to my family. And here it is. It happened to my family. It's one of those surreal things that you're like, this could never in a million years happen to us. And it did. So, um, yeah, that's, but no, I've never, not even once worried about any of that. Uh, unfortunately, when you're related to somebody who's been a serial killer or your brother and sister, both considered serial killers, obviously people are going to judge you. Oh, what kind of family did you come from? What, you know, so obviously it's going to hurt my dating life. But other than that, 
Well, not not according to the uh, women of STS Nation. I've seen uh, haven't been pulling them up because it's a little inappropriate for this conversation. But now so, I'll start to. But they they all say you're easy on the eyes, Adam. So uh, well, that 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 could be you know something. But then when you sit down, they're like, okay, so let's talk about your family. Like I've been on a first day. Do you start? You try to avoid all the family situations when you're trying to sit there and talk. And then when you do tell them, and everybody apparently knows this story because ninety. 9% of women in America watch true crime. So it's there. There's no, there's no really getting out of it. Well, that was going to be a, a future question. Um, yeah. Rex, to that point, you know, we've got people in this chat right now um, from Israel, from Australia, from New Zealand. What is it about this case that has uh, really gripped the world, not just the United States? Well, that was a big surprise to me. Um, Adam likes to joke that it's taken four four uh, psychologists to help me cope. I have I, I have seen two different psychologists, two different counselors about this. But what I've heard from psychologists as I talk about this, I ask that question: Why are people so drawn to this case? I know it's bizarre, but there are a lot of bizarre things that happen. They say the psychologists have told me what people are looking for is confirmation that they could never do something this bizarre. They're looking to assign a reason for which she did it and say, I could never do that. So um, my answer to your question is, I don't know <laughs> why there are so many people, but that's the a, that's a answer I've heard from uh, three different psychologists now. Uh, Adam, do you have a guess as to why so many people, like you said, you go on a date, everyone's going to know your family story. Why? Uh, I mean, anytime kids are, are being killed, um, you know, that's that's always, you know, people's heart breaks when that happens. And then you have two spouses that got killed and you got a couple that got married right after one of the spouses was killed and you got you know brandon who got shot at and there's like this it's like an onion and you peel back an onion and there's just more and more and more and it just keeps getting crazier and crazier so when people just see a story they go deeper and deeper and deeper and they're like how is all this happening to this one family you know what i mean so i think the interest goes to that because of how crazy the scenario is um and again like i said you know i know people are into true crime. Unfortunately, Rex and I don't have a lot of true crime experience. Um, I watch mostly uh, sports and and uh, funny movies, but um, I realize that there's a lot of interest in it. And and we we brought up this on a podcast. I feel like women who watch true crime are more aware of their surroundings. Like when they park their car at Walmart, they're walking in, they're they're checking their surroundings because they saw some true crime thing where somebody got you know, hijacked or whatever it is. So I think there's a lot of positive things that come out of true crime, just more aware of things with the women that could be more aware of their surroundings. Adam, by the way, people have been clamoring for us to start STS singles and uh, you could be the bachelor of STS singles. Uh, and the right. women here have already said, Hey, Adam, we know your story. We don't care. So, oh, yeah, uh, right. STS nation, STS singles at gmail.com, I guess. Uh, send there us you uh, go. Send us your little bio and a photo. We'll send them on to Adam. Um, Rex, to you, do you think any other members in your family were marked for death? Uh, who yes. else might have been on the death list? Well, we know Adam was because the text that was shared in court and also on one of the TV specials um, between Lori and Alex, Lori said, bad news. Um, Brother. Yeah, uh, bad or, news. And Alex said what? She said, "Oh, bad news about our brother." Alex said what? She said, "Z for zombie." So, um, so Adam, we know was on that list, and anyone that would cross Lori or that Lori felt um, wasn't supporting her. So potentially, who knows where it would have ended? And I, I've got to throw this in, if you don't mind. Thank God for Kay and Larry Woodcock that got the ball rolling and, and became the face of the media and got the media involved, who knows where this would have gone and how many, how many more people would have died. 
Yeah, and I'm so glad you mentioned Kay and Larry. They've been on my show. Uh, beautiful people, all of you guys. It's it's amazing, like the contrast between the story that we know publicly and the people who you are. You can just see uh, that that Lori is this incredible outlier who just, for whatever reason, um, completely uh, fell off the rails. Jenny Price says, "Yes, thank God for them." Um, Adam. Now that we know uh, that you're on this hit list, um, how frightening is that? I mean, you're a big, strong, professional pickleball player, but um, how frightening is it in retrospect? You know, when you're just like alone at home thinking about, you know, you're watching baseball, but you're thinking, man, I was on that hit list. Um, do you, what's it do to you? Well, first, you can't say big, bad pickleball players. <laughs> <laughs> those, it's an those oxymoron. Don't. <laughs> yeah, those don't those don't go hand in hand. Um, there was a time where uh, when I was staying w at Summer's house with my son, and I talk about this experience in my book when Charles was killed and we found out about it. And I was and Summer was gone uh, on vacation. I was and me and Zach were watching her dog. Well, that night after you know Alex killed Charles and I knew that he murdered him. I just had that feeling. There was no way that he shot him in self-defense. And so with that, that night, me and Zach stayed up all night looking around, locking the doors, having the lights on. We didn't go to bed that night. We caught the earliest flight out back to Kansas where we were living at six o'clock when we left the house. And that night was the scariest night of my life thinking he could come kill me and Zach. Um, I didn't know why he would. Cause at that point I was like, well, maybe they just killed Charles for, um, you know, the insurance money, or I, I couldn't even think, because at this point we didn't know anything about Chad. We didn't know anything about, you know, the zombie thing. I didn't know any of that. But then when I found out about the, the text, what was that about a year ago or whenever that came out, um, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if Alex could actually walk up to me, see me and shoot me. Um, and so I've been debating that part of it. Like, I, I know he killed the kids and I know he, you know, helped and he killed Charles, but I was thinking there's no way he could, he could see me eye to eye and, and shoot me. I, I just don't think he could do it. Um, but again, I could be completely wrong and, and he could have done that. So not sure that, that, that's the only thought that I have. I don't really think about it a lot since, you know, that's never going to happen now. Yeah. I, I mean, I know this is not intentional in any way and everyone's got their own, way of dealing with things but you kind of matter of factly just said that uh alex did kill jj and ty lee um how do you square that in your own mind that this guy who you were tight with your own brother did have that capacity and it's so hard for you understandably to, to think that he could have done it to you but how do you negotiate that um in your own mind well, Rex and I talked about this in the book and in our podcast about that that particular thing. Alex must have been completely sold, completely all in. I know Chad apparently put his hands on his head and gave him some great blessing and told him that he was an angel from another world. He had him believing all these things. And for Alex to actually do the things that he did, he must have believed that he was doing it for a higher cause. It wasn't that he wanted to kill people or that he had a murderous heart or anything like that. I believe that in my mind, I think that he thought he was doing it for a cause. Um, you know, in, in my mind, I think, you know, Chad said that before the Lord comes that they're going to have to gather these people and these things are going to have to all be done. And I think Alex just bought all in. I don't know how he bought in. I don't know how brainwashing works or I don't know how you could feel like, you know, that could be something possible, but he did. And so I feel like he had to been completely all in to be able to do something like that. And Rex, it feels like everyone went all in at the point, uh, and I don't know if it's coincidence, but when Chad got into the picture, and uh, I don't want to be critical, but Chad looks like this like little doughboy, just kind of a putz of a nobody. Has You look at Adam Cox, and he's got charisma. You look at you, you've got charisma. The guy has nothing. And so where do you think this influence that he seemingly had over Lori and Alex, where do you think this came from? Or did it just evolve because it was a coincidence in time? Um, real answer, I don't know. But I speculate that he had for them what they really deep down wanted. 
and whether that was um, to be important, well, that that would be what it was, is to tell them how important they are. And, and people in that circle, apparently, that believe all the stuff that is in the book, Visions of Glory, and all the stuff Julie Rowe was spewing and all of that, people in there, according to Brax, again, our uh, family member, that's that's power. When you say, hey, I can see beyond the veil in heaven and they're talking to me. If people buy into that, that's that's like cocaine, I guess. I haven't tried coke myself, but <laughs> uh, I understand that's that's what it's like. And so they're in they're in uh, his delusion now, mm -hmm. you know, and, Rex is dropping disclaimers. I love it. Um, by the way, apparently don't, I didn't know yeah. Rex had a I, Rex was a child of the sixties, but I didn't know it was that far. Rex, so, stay uh, away. We did a whole show on fentanyl yesterday. I don't want to see it end for you now. You got too good a smile. Um, <laughs> Philadelphia shoulder surgeon. I was literally just going to read that comment. Coe. I love. I love when I'm going to the comment, and then I made it disappear. Uh, I know you mentioned Zulema. Uh, Rex, have you, has anyone in the family been in touch with Zulema? Yeah. Yeah. Family members have. Janice was, um, okay. when, when Alex was killed or died or whatever, however you want to describe it, mm -hmm. there was a very small memorial service. Zulema was there. In fact, she kind of approved it because she was a wife and ran it and, and kind of had a say in the few people that were there. And I was there. One of my daughters, Janice was there. Barry was there. So just a few people, notably not Adam, because they were only inviting people that they felt didn't think Alex was a serial killer. Now, I thought he was, but they invited me anyway, because I'm, I don't know why, but I was glad, glad to go. And so that's the only time I've had interaction with Zulema. Janice had interaction for a while after that and then lost trust in her rather quickly. Uh, Adam's got to jump in three minutes. I have two more questions for him. Uh, one here is from uh, the PSS. If you ever need so shoulder surgery because of pickleball, Alex, uh, Philadelphia is your woman. Um, why was your dad declared a zombie? I never understood where that came from. Care to answer that? You mean on Chad's uh, dark dark list, like a dark three, a yeah. dark four, a zombie? Yeah. I don't know a lot about it. I know when the FBI confiscated his um, computer, it had all that stuff on there, and I don't know where he comes up with it. Apparently, I was on the light list before Lori told me she was a translated being, and I told her that she's crazy. Then after that, I think I went directly to a dark four. So I don't know how that whole thing works and why people are you know claimed whatever they are but it's just it's all nonsense mm. um adam what's a question that no one has asked you yet that you're either surprised that no one has asked or no one has asked covering all my oh, bases here give me a question gosh, give me, give me one question cool. and don't and don't say do i have 12 pack abs because i know you'll say yes to that no, I do else. not have. I do not have twelve pack abs. <laughs> by the way, it. by the way, Chad Daybell wouldn't even if <laughs> STS singles. He wouldn't even be in the uh, in the in the hemisphere of that uh, uh, organization. But uh, uh, no, I've, seriously, I've been asked. So, I've been asked so many questions that I I feel like I've been asked everything. But who knows? I, I mean, there could be any question. I feel like I've answered every single question that I can think of. Um, but well, let me ask yeah. you one. What, what makes you a good pickleball player? I mean, you're this guy who said that you never, no one, I mean, everyone doubted you. And I have a lot of this. I've got a lot of chips on my shoulders. Yeah. Um, people said, Hey, you'll never get the national news. And I did it. Um, but yeah. where, where does it from? I know where my competitive edge comes from, but where did, where, where does it come from with you? Um, I've always been competitive. I think I was born competitive. I've been playing sports my whole life. I heard about pickleball five years ago and uh first time i picked up a pickleball paddle i was like oh my gosh this is for me and i play basketball football baseball i never even heard of pickleball and then you know once i started i was like oh my gosh i'm hooked so playing five hours a day is probably not healthy but that's what i did for about a year so uh i i think i put way too much into whatever i'm into uh, <laughs> but it does it seems to help um 
glad to hear. Look at Meg P. I love having Adam and Rex on. They are fantastic guests. Will you come back on, Adam? Yes or no? Sure. Yeah. Let me know when you guys can. My my schedule is crazy. I know I'm, I apologize for yesterday, but um, <laughs> it, it is literally nuts. Well, let me say this before I let you go. Honestly, it's the first time that we have ever met. But again, I feel this uh, charisma, this energy, this positivity that comes from you. And uh, you will never, ever be defined um, by the tragedy that happened in your family. And I, I think everyone here at STS Nation agrees with that. Um, as my mother would say, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, you've been to hell and back, and you still got that smile on your face. So uh, go kiss, kick ass on the pickleball court. And uh, thank you for being here, man. Love it. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate uh, spending some time with you guys. It was it was great. We'll see you soon. And Rex, uh, Uncle Grunkle Rex, give us a few more minutes here. Um, one of the questions I know you guys are you know both religious um, or you know went through periods. I don't know to the extent uh, that you are are uh, you know how devout you are. I should say. But did this whole experience, um, I spoke to someone today, they lost their father. I lost my father a few months back and they said the way they lost their father, which was through illness, completely turned them off to religion and turned them off to God. Um, and they had some other tragedies go on. Did you ever come across a moment where you were questioning your own faith because of what faith apparently did to Lori? No, that... That has never done it. I've, um, there are reasons and experiences in my life I've never had to doubt. I consider that a gift. I think everyone gets gifts when they come into this life. And uh, that's one that I have, just kind of a believing a believing heart. So I've never had that situation. But I can certainly understand why people do. Good heavens, there are terrible, terrible things that happen to wonderful people. So I understand people questioning and turning and doubting. Um, and you mentioned, uh, you know, therapy, which I think is getting both my parents. My dad is a, was a retired psychiatrist. I still use him in the present tense, which is sad. By the way, this is the book that Rex and Adam wrote, Lori's Lies and Family Ties. And all the proceeds are going to a charity. So uh, please pick up a copy and uh, support the charity and support uh, Rex and Adam. Um you know, my dad is, was a retired psychiatrist. My mother is a social worker. Um, and I think it's becoming obviously a lot more accepted in mainstream. I'm curious, has the therapy helped you? Like, do, do you find it helpful? Is it leading you in a certain direction? Yes. And I'll say, I believe it's because I found people I connected with. I think that's the big thing in, in therapy. And so I understand why so many people haven't gotten anything out of it if they didn't connect with a, a therapist. And I'll say also it's helped. It wasn't the biggest factor. Um, I had a, one is a dear friend. I, it's not a formal therapy, but I went to a traditional therapist that you pay. Um, and I, and it was helpful. It was very helpful. It gave me perspectives I didn't have. Um, we had a good connection, but I understand people that don't do that. And a lot of our, optimists haven't gone to formal therapy and they are getting i won't say they're getting therapy because i don't want to say well this replaces that but a lot of us are getting help just from being in the community with each other and sharing and hearing other people and supporting other people hmm. uh, i'm so glad shady lamps brought this up because it was actually my first question and uh, i got distracted uh, Lori's lies and family ties. We've see, we see this, um, what appears to be a drawing, uh, and shady lamps would like you to explain the cover, please. And thank you, shady lamps. We love shady lamps. She's, uh, she's also an optimist. And so she's heard this story, but, um, my daughter Kaylee, who is the nanny for Tylee and JJ, which means she is in the home and she and Colby being around the same age, they just got close like a brother and sister. Of course, you're spending that much time. And then for reasons that I won't go into, Colby had to cut off members of, of his family when he got married, including including Kaylee, and it was is a real loss to her. Well, all of this goes down now. And when they found the ch children's body, of course, Kaylee, along with all of us, was just devastated and devastated for Colby and couldn't reach out to him. We couldn't 
couldn't interact with them at the time. And she sat down. She has a gift with art, just a gift. She sat down with a photograph of Colby and JJ. And this Colby, picture him where Tylee is right now. And then she took another photograph of Tylee, put it next to him, and did this in wood burning. This is a wood burning. And she, she would burn this picture with all three of them um, walking into the water to give to Colby. And it was very, very touching. Well, we wanted to use it for the cover for the book. We, we got Kaylee's permission, but couldn't get in touch with Colby. Um, so we left Colby out just out of respect. We didn't want to use him if we didn't know what his thought on it would be. So that's why you see JJ and Tylee is from an actual photo, but wood burned by Kaylee. Wow. It's a really beautiful image. Um, kudos to you guys. And, uh, I, I am going to get this book and I'm going to read this book. Um, I have a few more. You have, you have a few more minutes, Rex. We'll go yeah. like another five, 10 minutes. Um, the podcast, the silver linings podcast. Um, someone here says, Oh, it's Lindsay, Lindsay who helped organize. It's an amazing piece. Um, tell me and forgive me if you mentioned this off the top, but, um, the evolution of the podcast or, or the Genesis, what, what, you know, you guys are obviously two, um, well-spoken gregarious outgoing, individuals but what made you convert that into a podcast that's very generous of you thank you i thought you were going to say you two are obviously not <laughs> professional podcasters <laughs> as our optimists know um but we said when we decided to write the book together to collaborate on the book we also said well let's do a podcast and ask people what would be a benefit in the book and we thought about it and said, you know, maybe we can stretch this out into 10 episodes of a podcast. And that's probably about all the family insight people would want. Sure enough, when we started, several people joined us at the beginning because Gigi McElvey interviewed us and, and Lauren Mathias interviewed us and Nate Eaton interviewed us. So a lot of people came and a lot of people said, they don't, they aren't very good at true crime. We know more than they do. <laughs> and so... They didn't continue listening, but the people that that remained um, turned into this community I, that we've been talking about. And they got together and they they um, another another couple of your STS Nation people, uh, Kimberly, that uh, we saw one of her comments on here. She organized a Facebook group, didn't ask us, just mm -hmm. organized one. And said, by the way, you guys, I did a Facebook group. Do you want to join? And Lindsay works with her on it. And they they uh, organized this Facebook group. And the people there are just wonderful. They're wonderful to each other. And when we finished our 10 episodes, we said, okay, that's we were we were right. We got what we need for the book. And we really don't have, you know, would just be repeating family perspective, which we've done many times. But people were saying, wait, don't stop. We're getting so much out of this. And of course, your ego says, oh, they really like you. Well, my ego knew enough to say, really? Why? You aren't getting it from us. No, they're getting it from the whole experience, from commenting and having people reply to the comments and be supportive of other people, not be, not be rude to other people. And it just grew into a tremendous, tremendous healing community, not professional healing, but just a healing community. And we're still, Adam and I are still trying to run to, to catch up and figure out just what's going on there, but it's been tremendous. Yeah. And uh, usually it's uh, the non-professionals are the best at what they do. The prof prof uh, professionals try to be too cool for school. Dom's mom here says, it's awesome what you and Adam have done with the podcast. It's informative, uplifting your guys' strength alone brings so much hope to victims, families of victims. It's a beautiful thing. How does that make you feel, Rex? Uh, not to sound like a therapist, just that you're having this impact of um, spreading this optimism from such darkness. Well, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the thought and the way she said it. Um, I'm going to limit 
I'm going to limit the amount of credit I'm going to take. I'm, I don't take as much credit as she offered there because, like I said, we don't have it figured out. So you, it's not like we orchestrated it to get that result. People created that result with or without us, so to speak. So we'll take credit for providing a platform to get them together. And we like, like you do, you're the king of getting the great guests on, on board. We like the guests we get, and that's helpful. Okay, we, we aren't nearly as proficient as you are. I love what, what you do. But um, we'll, we'll take credit for having a platform, but you, I've got to give credit for the rest of it to the, to the optimists. Um, Ida Shaw here is a lawyer says, look, you know, I'm changed. I felt bad at first, but I stayed and listened. I appreciate these two men. I apologize for prejudging you guys. I'm glad I heard you. Uh, peace and love. Um, it's just the way the world, I think people sometimes are judgmental if there's someone uh, who's in the family who is uh, a bad apple. Someone was asking earlier, uh, Rex, if there is mental illness that runs in the family. Um, is there? I don't know that there's more than most families. Um, I don't, there's no diagnosed mental illness that, that runs through the family. Um, I believe mental illness is a factor in Lori's case. Everything's a factor. But the bottom line is she chose to do evil. Whether it's, you take into account the mental illness, you take into account, was she abused as a child? I don't know. I don't have any proof of that, but Maybe she was. You take into account um, the religious teachings. You know, did that play into it? I'm sure they played into it. Everything played into it. But that doesn't mean you have to choose to kill your children. 100%. Um, my great, wonderful father always quoted John Paul Sartre, the only choice you do not have is not to choose. My dad was a big, as a psychiatrist, big proponent of choice, even if... Um, you know, something was um, inspiring you or religion was dragging you to a to a place. Ultimately, he believed you have a choice. It's whether or not you're able to execute that choice properly. Uh, Lori Vallow, um, I guess, fell short of that. Um, Shaggy here says, uh, I know you said you haven't spoken to Lori, but if you could ask her any question, any single question, what would you want to ask Lori now? Well, as Adam said earlier, I, I agree with that completely. I don't think you could have a normal conversation and get an answer to questions we want to ask, like, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, so if, but if she came out of that delusion and I had a chance to talk to her, my question would be, how are you alive right now? How are you out of the delusion recognizing the evil that you perpetrated that has affected millions and millions of people, and certainly not the least of which are you, your two children that you murdered. How are you still on the earth? How can you bear to, to carry that burden? That's what I would ask, but we'll never get that chance because I don't think she will be on the earth if she comes out of that delusion. And, um, you know, it was literally um, maybe God's will or a technicality in the law or maybe both. But Lori pretty much skated by without the death penalty. And that there is a chance that uh, if things went in other direction, she could have been death penalty eligible. Um, is that something that you've considered? Do you think she deserves that ultimate punishment? Well, here's here's my view on that. I have one daughter. We were weighing in at the time with my, I was weighing with my daughters. We processed this a lot, um, well, the whole case a lot. And I said, what do y'all think? And one of my daughters, it surprised me. She said, no, nope, I'm against the death penalty. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. She said, I want Lori to sit in a jail and wake up every day knowing what she did and living a miserable life in a rotting in a jail cell. So, right. wow. This girl is angry. <laughs> that is harsh, but I'm I'm kind of with her. And you know, I I want as much justice as we can get in this life for these victims. Um, but in this life, um, I think the real justice is going to be after this life. So 
yes, I'm all for getting as much justice as we can, then leave it to God to do the rest. And um, and I will say, if you don't mind me adding this, I noticed early in the interview, um, Rabbit had a question that came up here, the COE put it up, and she asked if we feel her prayers. Yes, yes, definitely. That's beautiful. Um, and that is the power of prayer right there. Uh, you hear Rex saying that he's feeling it. Um, Charlie, uh, Catherine says, I love the audio book. What a wonderful way to heal journaling. Thank you for sharing. It's great to do. Charlie Barrow, I don't know that I can agree with this comment completely. Uh, Lori was simply wanting a better life, no stress, caring for the children, goddess status and money. Those were her motives. She lives a normal life when she was with Charles. Um, people have, and I'm not blaming it all on mental illness, and I'm certainly not saying that anyone who's mentally ill has the capacity to do this. Almost no one who is mentally ill has the capacity to, to do this, but I think it was more than just this alone. To what extent, I don't think anyone is ever going to know. Uh, since I just finished a book and I've got to do an audio book with my beloved mother, which is going to be quite challenging. Um, I'm curious, how did you and Adam collaborate? Um, where did you guys take turns writing chapters? It's not. It's 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 easier said than done. How did you work together on it? Well. Um... Do you already have a publisher? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The book's coming out uh, in May, May 14th. It'll be out. I'll look forward to that. Um, yeah. Our publisher saved our, our tail ends on this one. It was one of our optimists who said, hey, I have a publishing company. Can I help you? And boy, did she help us. So we would send to the editor, her editor, who is her son, Aiden Harris, we'd send him our stuff, our writings, and he would take it and make it stuff it wasn't. <laughs> he would he would do that. So our collaborating was really writing down whatever we could, and they we kind of collaborated with them on a kind of straw man structure. And then we wrote down what our part of that, and he took it and turned it into something something a lot better than it was. Hmm. Um, plans for the trial, um, obviously. Chad is next. And then Lori, do you plan to attend either trial? Um, game time, game time decision. Uh, I didn't plan to, to go to Lori's trial. And then my daughters were going, I thought, Oh, I'll be a good dad and support them. And ended up talking to the media and having a really a transformation while I was there. Um, and so I wouldn't, I'm not going to rule out going to Chad's trial. If there's something I love taking the opportunity to thank you, to thank media people, anyone that puts any energy into this case, any life energy into finding justice for the victims of this horrific tragedy. I love taking the opportunity to thank them. So I imagine I'll show up a day or two just to do that, just to thank people again, to thank Kay and Larry again. They're probably tired of me thanking them because every time I see them, that's how I start the conversation. Um, <laughs> but there are so many people involved and I can't thank them enough. So I wouldn't be surprised if I went for that reason. Um, for Lori's, um, yeah, I imagine I'll be there for the for the same reason. Um, a difficult question. Uh, how do you remember JJ entirely? Is there something you know, a place that you go to either in your mind or physically, uh, what do you do to honor them? Yeah, we are, we are building into our lives, just regular reminders, regular triggers, triggers in a positive way to remember them. We love, we love the wristband idea. We love, um, of course, the, the podcast, it started out being Tylee and JJ silver linings, um, then we changed that when we kind of adjusted the direction of the podcast. But we have several um, ways to remember them. And they're all very positive, very loving. And, and uh, all the memories are very loving. Um, this has been an unbelievable. Uh, I was excited to talk to both of you. I know, uh, you know, that um, you guys reached out and I was I was. I said to myself, man, maybe we are uh, being noticed because uh, the Vallow family reached out and wanted to come on my show. I could not believe it. So uh, love having you here. I appreciate you being a guest. I can tell um, what amazing people you 
uh, and Adamar and uh, obviously Kay and Larry I've had on the show. Uh, they're equally um, incredible. You're By right. the way, we're doing we're doing another show in 13 minutes. I'm not sure I'm going to get through that one. It is on the uh, Michelle Traconis trial. We are in verdict watch uh, for that. But Rex, I just wanted to give you the floor uh, for a minute to let out whatever you need to let out. Uh, again, there's just no way for any of us to know what you've been through. I just want you to know that, um, you know, seeing my mom's story, uh, there's always, um, as maybe corny and cliche as it sounds, there's always that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. And I think you've already found it, but uh, your final thoughts tonight. Yeah, everyone, everyone has a story, most everyone, everyone that's left in our community. Some people, you know, want true crime and and they don't need to heal. They aren't hurt by the, the story. But I think the people that stayed with us in the community have their own stuff that they have to deal with. And there's so many of us that have tragedies in our lives. And um, so it's it's wonderful, as I said, to be around people like that. And you're so appreciative to anyone that gives life energy to hear it, to share it, to support other people like you're doing. So I'm just really grateful for that. One more shout out. I saw KCL came up there and said, I'm part of SDS Nation and I'm an optimist. She's the person that came up with the name optimist for us. So a shout out to her and her positive energy. Yeah, KCL is a special one. She helps us behind the scenes with a bunch of cases. She should be a lawyer if she's not already, but uh, don't think she is. So uh, KCL, that is in your future. Huge, huge shout out to uh, Adam Cox. Who knew he was a DJ for Z100 in New York? I had no idea until tonight. You learned something new on STS. And then, of course, uh, the fabulous Rex Connor, who is Lori Vallow Daybell's uncle, uh, and their book, Lori's Lies and Family Ties, and of course, the podcast, Silver Linings. Uh, Rex, it was an absolute pleasure. Please, and I mean this sincerely, uh, send STS Nation's love to your entire family, uh, wishing you only good things. I uh, hope you can do that for us. Will do, certainly. And thank you very much. Love being here and being part of it. Thank you. And love you, America. Love you, Utah, Idaho, and Arizona. See you in eight minutes. Bathroom break. Take care, everyone.